I'm Stephen W. Long. This is The Writing Life. And uh, without an ounce of hyperbole, I have to say we are honored to have uh, Kim Stafford with us today. And, you know, I was thinking uh, Mr. Stafford needs no introduction, but that's not going to stop me because I want to I wanna say a couple of things here. Uh, Governor Kate Brown called uh, Kim Stafford one of, the, uh, one of our state's most generous literary teachers, which I heartily agree with. Uh, I hope we can talk about this. You hold a PhD in medieval literature, right? Yes. At the sir. University of Oregon. Yeah. And uh, I was thinking that could be its own show, but may maybe later. Uh, you're the founding director of the Northwest Writing Institute at Lewis and Clark. That's correct. And here's maybe a little bit of a curveball. You're also a songwriter. Oh, yeah, I got to have a song now and then. Okay. Yeah. So I, and I want to start there. Yeah. Because I had a conversation with a friend. And we were talking about Leonard Cohen, oh, yeah. who is both a poet and a songwriter. Yes. And my friend questioned, should songwriters be held to a higher standard with their lyrics because you're trying to convey uh, an emotion or a thought or something, and they have the added tool of the music. Any thoughts on that? Well, the music, uh, the music adds some magic for sure. Yeah. You know, you, uh, a poem... Uh, it can go straight to the heart, but uh, the music, uh, you know, parts the waters really <laughs> and takes down your defenses. Okay. Uh, uh, music is a universal language. If the words fall away, people from You've another land got, could right. still be touched. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, and that echoes what I think, and I'll just expand on that a little bit. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I've had, because I'm a writer as well, we've had conversations about. Uh, forms of art, yes. and uh, certainly writing is a yeah. form of art, and I think it's the most difficult form in that if there was a piece of statuary or music or a painting or something, yeah. to some extent anybody from anywhere could yes. draw, gather something from that. Mm -hmm. But when it's writing, it's so cryptic. It's, it's uh, black marks on white paper and yeah. The, even if you know the language, then you have to take that in yeah. and do something with it. Yeah, so it, in a way it's esoteric and distant in that way, but at the same time it's our bread and butter every day. We're, you know, we're talking to sure. each other, we're talking to our kids. So the, one of the dangers with poetry is, uh, you know, is it, is it just uh, exchanging information or is it casting a spell? You know, you use the material of daily conversation, but you try to... Um, Give it all the juice you can. Okay. You know, what a great segue. Because I wanted to, and I and I like to ask this of poets: What is it about poetry that, um, and I don't mean in a technical kind of way, but but sets it apart from prose? Why is it so impactful? Well, as I travel around the state, one of the things I've been saying is uh, poetry is our native language. We have to learn how to do prose. Oh. Justified prose on the page, that's a discovery uh, post-Gutenberg. But uh, poetry, speaking not in sentences or paragraphs, but in units of breath, essentially in oh, poetic boy. lines, where the pause, the hesitation, the negative space, may be as expressive as the words, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that's poetry. Great. Uh, phrases, syllables, mm -hmm. sounds going together, uh, prose just going along without a change and so on. That's not our native language. That, that's a reader's experience. I've never thought of yeah. that. Yeah, but poetry, yeah. that's what we do every day. <laughs> and this just came to me. Uh, lots of information has been passed on orally. Do you think that's how or why? Yeah, well, I think uh, poetry uh, puts language together in a way that's easy to remember, uh, that uh, survives over time. Uh, speaking of medieval literature, you know, much of the uh, poetry I studied was by the greatest poet of all, Anonymous. Okay. You know, uh, he the was name prolific. is forgotten. Yeah, <laughs> or she. Or she. Uh, <laughs> Name's forgotten, but the way the words are put together 
uh, is like a, a canoe that gets them, you know, down the river of time. Yeah. Gosh, I'd never thought of that. Thank yeah, you for yeah. Because I and I've asked lots of people. Uh, yeah. Never been explained. Well, you know, like my that. baby sister when I was little, one time she said, uh, "A story just goes along, but a poem has to pound and pound." Okay. You know, there's that heartbeat rhythm, or walking rhythm, or a horse uh, cantering rhythm mm -hmm. in a poem that takes it halfway to song. All right. Let me ask you something else. <clears throat> uh, in fact, I, I want to read a quote from you. We're living in a time when language is used in destructive ways and I'm eager to help Oregonians restore truth through poetry. Um, we're bombarded by news but I feel that the news is half the truth, just events, facts, and statistics. Yeah. So then coming back to poetry, one of the um, attributes of poetry yeah. is its precision. Yes. It's just the right word. Yeah. Oh boy, that yeah. and it's distilled down, and boy, it's just yeah. the right thing. Except sometimes it isn't. Yeah. Sometimes it's cryptic. Yeah. And uh, what I wanted to ask you is, when it's like that, has it failed? Is it bad poetry, or is there? You know, before we started filming, you talked yeah. about reaching out a yeah. and working a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think um, you know, like all arts there's a huge spectrum of oh, okay. what poetry is and can be. And at one end of the spectrum, there are very esoteric, okay. difficult, complex, dense poems that require critics to explain them. And critics love that kind of poetry. So that <laughs> kind of poetry then becomes famous. It gets in textbooks. Okay. And where students have to try to decipher it. But at the other end of the spectrum, there are poems that are very plain spoken, friendly to the listener, uh, you know, a child could understand and appreciate, mm -hmm. and that too is good. Okay. You know, I must say good work can be done at any point along that at either spectrum. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's a writer in Portland, Gary Miranda, he says, well, you know, people who don't read or write poetry may be spared the inconvenience of thought. Uh, you know, Ouch. <laughs> so sometimes if you have to reach for it a little bit, that's right. okay. On the other hand, uh, we've probably both read things where you're reading it and you say, this writer must be brilliant. I can't understand anything they're saying. And then you think, wait a minute, this writer must be very unskilled. I can't understand what they're saying. Right. Yeah. So it's a dynamic project. You know, sometimes I do poems and uh, I realize I'm there's some code in there, you know. There's some uh, some mystery in okay, there. Okay, when you do that, it's meaningful to you, though. Yeah. You're not trying to be obscure. No, no, I'm not yeah. trying to be obscure. Yeah. I'm trying to uh, reach for the true complexity of human experience. Okay. You know, it can be simplified. It can be dumbed down. But human experience is highly nuanced and uh, and complex. And you want to you want to do two things. You, you want to be amb ambidextrous. You want to bring the reader to this delicious complexity that you've discovered. Okay. And you want to find a way to connect those. And so we may be back to that precision. Yeah. But the precision yeah. isn't necessarily simple. No, no. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll just give you a line of poetry. This is by uh, Pablo Neruda, and this is a translation. So it's very simple, but it's big. He, it's a love poem from his early work where he says to his beloved, I would do for you what spring does for the cherry trees. Oh my gosh. You know, just a few words, but it's this huge, wow. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the idea of it, <coughs> the, the fervor of it is, is just beautiful and big. Yeah. There's a line, uh, Eric Clapton has a song, um, and I, I'm gonna blow it, but uh, something about uh, m your love is really something good. And you're thinking, well, gee, that's simple, but it's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's kind of right on. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, the simple things can be big things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's great. Um, I know you, you're our poor, poet laureate. That's what the governor says. I read that, and I read the definition of that. But what is it to you? What does that mean? Well, um, you know, I, I, I've, I've sort of been doing this for a long time. Yeah. You know, the Northwest Writing Institute. I mean, what, what is that? It's right. a little tiny uh, program with a big reach, a big idea. 
uh, that the Northwest is a region, that we're all neighbors here, that our history, the history of uh, tribes is the history of us now, the history of many cultures moving through this place. So uh, I feel that I want to go forth and witness for uh, culture. We each have our own way of speaking, our own way of thinking. We can't have a democracy culturally without every voice contributing to uh. that. So. Um, you know, a friend told me, we have two things. We have a vote, very important, and we have a voice. And the vote, no matter how important it is, it's finite. It can be counted. But the voice can grow. You know, to have a child speak about the future, to have a child work on a poem or a song or a story so that it gets all our attention, and in effect, it becomes a bigger vote. Oh, what we're sure. about. So I feel like as Poet Laureate, I want to go around <clears throat> and share poetry and also share the idea of having a creative practice in one's life, that we need the voice of each person. And uh, my father used to say, you can legislate freedom of speech, but you have to learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. It's not just a given. We have to learn how to freely access the best we have in our minds and put it forth in the best form so that it can be uh, part of uh, our ongoing story as a nation. Okay, and I think that you think then that that can be learned. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I know from direct experience, I, I get better in little ways, mm -hmm. little incremental ways. And I see students, uh, you know, start being all tongue-tied and I don't have any ideas, I don't have anything worth saying. <laughs> And then they go into the trance of writing, and they share a beautiful thing. Yeah. yeah. So I know it can be learned. All right. Now, I have read that you take this notion to maybe homeless people and yeah. so on. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that, how, how you do it, what you give and what you get. Yeah. Well, you know, I've been, uh, being Port Laureate is kind of a passport to a lot of places. So, for example, I went to the Two Rivers prison up in Umatilla, and a guy named Johnny Stallings got me in there. He's been going every week for years okay. to just sit with a group of inmates and uh, have a dialogue, have a conversation. So I went, and, uh, you know, the guys were talking about uh, being separate from their children. They were talking about... Uh, thinking about what they had done and trying to envision a life ahead. And, you know, these are things where poetry can be a tool for this. So I wrote a poem for them oh. called Two Rivers. And uh, in the poem, I took that, this is what often happens in a poem. I just took the phrase, so that's the name of this uh, facility, I think, as the Umatilla and the Columbia come together. But two rivers, I started thinking, well, maybe one river is the one you see above ground. And the other is the underground river of one's essential innocence as a human being, one's oh. essential goodness. Okay. You know, so some people say, I know who you are, I know what you did. And that's uh, above ground. Yeah, that's the above ground. Yeah. But you've got this other, I wanted to say to the people there, there's this other river of who you want to be. Yeah. And what you love and what you want to do. And that river can become visible through writing. You know, so, so that's one example of sort of taking my mission of we need every voice. And one of the people in the prison said, you know, when I'm in my cell, I'm an inmate. When I'm writing, I'm a person. Oh, boy. And I thought, mission uh, accomplished. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of gets me. <laughs> yeah, good. Mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, before we get too far down the road, can you read something? Oh, sure. I'll, I'll yeah. just recite something. All right. So I have an anthem okay. uh, that I've been sharing. I'm going to share it tonight at the library here in McMinnville. Uh, it's called I Am the Seed. Okay. And I was telling the students at the high school today, the seed, you know, we're surrounded by all kinds of cacophony and terrible things are happening in the world and we're assaulted with, you know, things are being extinct. There's climate chaos and, you know, Congress impasse, all kinds of things. But the seed, the idea of a seed, a beginning, a new beginning, it can start small. It's so small, it's almost invisible, and then it grows into something. Okay. That's my article of faith. So it's called, I Am the Seed. Every chance I get, any place I fit, in a cleft of grit, 
in ravine or pit. By ancient wit, my husk, I split. I am the seed. I fell to the ground without a sound, by rainfall drowned, by sunlight found, by wonder crowned, through luck profound. I am the seed. After bout of grief, after fiery thief, though life is brief, I sprout relief with tiny leaf mm -hmm. beyond belief. I am the seed. I am the seed, small as a bead. Tell me your need, your hunger, I'll feed. Any trouble you're in, I will begin, for I am the seed. Up I rise to seek the prize from all that dies by bold surprise, small and wise, before your eyes, I am the seed. Oh, boy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank I'm you. so glad we captured that. Yeah, That's yeah. Great. You yeah. know, so that you know that just started with a few words, and then a few more words, and then words that want to be in the poem. They kind of come crowding around. Uh -huh. Let me in there. I want to be part of that story. And uh, to me, that seems like the, the way the natural world works. So, you know, we're okay. we're in the time that a friend of mine calls the Oregon Symphony. You know, really? in the spring when everything is just oh, the, the time plum of year. trees and the, all the buds right. are just breaking and the insects are coming back. And and I feel like I want to get in that kind of uh, spirit in writing to find there's this great abundance. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, again, a great segue. I want to read something and then have you comment on this. Okay. I just love this yeah. part. Uh, you had said, I close my eyes and suddenly I feel a great burden lifted from my shoulders. For it comes to me that I am not the prophet, yes. but, the, uh, but scribe to the prophet. When I write, I am secretary to a wisdom the world has made available to me the voices come from many around me, and I need more to be alert than wise. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so to be alert. So if I'm the kind of poet who goes into a trance and just thing just comes forth from me because I'm brilliant, uh, I, I'm curious, what would that be like? Because that's not my experience. <laughs> my experience is I'm constantly you know, like a leaf in the sun. I'm just receiving this bounty from the world. I'll give you another example. So I was in a, a prison called Columbia River Prison. It's up in uh, North Portland. And this fellow, Johnny Stallings, who got me in there, he you know, looked around the circle. He knew most of the guys. But there was one he didn't know. And he said, um, what's your name? Well, my name is Jamie, the man said. And Jamie, Johnny, Johnny said to him, Jamie, what is the nature of the love that is the foundation of your entire existence. You know, he, he doesn't mess around. He just goes in. I guess And not. there was this pause. Oh. And then Jamie just started into this aria. He started talking about love. He said, you know, there was, a, there was a big woman. She had a lot of love. She had a hard time getting around. So I took her around. We went to the homeless camp. We got all the first people, the lost and found people. We took them to the Sundance. You have to open your heart to the Creator. He can see you. And then you are clean. Once the blood flows, you are clean. And then, you know, he was just doing this. He was doing poetry out of his heart. Wow. And so I feel like my job is to honor that, to write that down. You know, Jamie's not going to write that down, but I'm going to write that down to give to him. And so I wrote the poem and sent it to the prison. It's called The Lost and Found People. Oh, boy. So I am the servant of the voices around me. And some of the voices come from me. And many come from other places. You know, the prophet is a child or a grief or a mystery or a an old lady who has a story to tell, yeah. you know, and I'm the servant to that. And I don't know that I, I said these words, but I got the, well, in fact, the, the prelude to that was uh, an epiphany that you said yeah. you had an epiphany. And it does, it probably does relieve that burden, but it also uh, <clears throat> realigns it and, uh, yeah. and lets you be a receptacle, yeah. lets you take yeah. it in. and. I had another teacher who one time said, uh, being a writer is a license to snoop. Oh. And that's a little bit different take on <laughs> yeah. this. But, but I think the thing is to be receptive, yeah. to look around. And, and <clears throat> uh, you said people wonder where ideas come from. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. It's yeah. The, it, the, the, the problem isn't to get an idea. It's to pick 
yeah. from the many. Yeah, uh, someone asked uh, the composer Bach, you know, Papa Bach, where do you get your ideas? Yeah. Oh, my child, I stumble over them getting out of bed. <laughs> you know, and I think for me, I, I should say, um, this is my secret. Okay. The notebook small enough to welcome small ideas. Okay. You know, that uh, I'm just constantly uh, putting things in a, my savings account. Right. You know, overhear something. I think of something. I remember something. I dream something. And I put it in here. And then when I sit down to write, I sort of go through this. And okay. Yeah. So this is, uh, I'm taking dictation on the world, back to the secretary right. uh, motif. And then I'm sort of putting them here. I want to say one thing about, um, I was saying to the students at the high school today, I don't want to be famous, but the things that have come to me or through me, I want them to have a voice in the world. So th that's my ambition, not to be known or uh, certainly not lionized, but to have the, the discoveries, the songs, the poems that, resonate that so, somehow out of all the universe chose me to say them mm -hmm. I want them to have a life in the world having said that um, I have to believe that you get pleasure from what you do oh yes yeah yeah it, it, it yeah. it's fulfilling yeah. whatever the word is yeah <clears throat> so I'll give you one example of that so um, we were down in San Francisco it was my wife's birthday we had this glorious day. We hiked in the Marin Hills. We mm. went to the museum. We went to the City Lights bookstore. We went out to dinner. We had this wonderful time. Came back to our car about 10.30 at night at Cesar Vallejo, and someone had broken the window in our car. You know, And so, of course, I was downcast. And then we looked in there. There's my guitar right there. You know, <laughs> There's our luggage. There are the car keys, right? You know, my wife's car keys. And so the next morning when I was writing... I decided to write um, in the voice of the person who broke the window. Okay. And by the time I finished the poem, I was laughing out loud. Because this guy, he's saying, uh, hey man, sorry somebody broke your window. You know why that happens? Like, they got so much in them, they don't want to hit a person, so they hit a car, man. Or maybe they're just curious what's in there. You know, like, see how the people that drive that car live. And, you know, but I've, I know a guy who can fix that window for you. His name is Ernie. Here's his phone number. You know, so I'm figuring out this guy, he's breaking windows and leaving his card. Yeah. So it's his life. So then I'm laughing out loud. So, yes, writing can be fun. Uh, you know, sometimes you come upon a downer. But often you start with a downer, and then as you're writing, you regain your buoyancy. That's what happens for me. Okay. Yeah. That's, again, that's interesting. Now, that I've experienced, but yeah. um, I've, I've never heard anybody say it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah where, uh, you know, in, in poetry we call it a turn. Okay. That the poem can start by looking head on at the darkness, at, you know, some dark thing. You lose a friend. You have a disappointment. You have a regret. You can start there. And then there's a turn in the poem where you learn from that. You, there's an upswing. Hmm. Uh, you know, you recover. You, once, because you've faced it, because you've looked at it in the eye, you're able to move beyond it. And so by the end of the poem, you're on the upswing. Do you think that part of that may be uh, the thrill of surviving? You, you, that you've looked at this yeah. thing and you got past it? Yeah, Maybe yeah, you, yeah. I think so. Uh, you know, yeah, made it again. My dad has a poem that ends. Cheated death made again. Made it again. <laughs> made it again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, your dad wrote a poem about, uh, and I wish I could recall it, but about a deer. Oh, yeah. Uh, his his uh, famous poem, Traveling Through the Dark. And he tells tell you a story about that poem. It was rejected 17 times. Great. He sent it to all these magazines, and it, it's, that's too mean, that's too dark. And finally, it became the title poem in his book that won the National Book Award. Sure. So writers... Persevere. Uh, e. E. Cummings wrote, I, th I think this is right, in the uh, acknowledgments in front of one of his books, he said, I dedicate this book to all of the publishers who rejected me yes. because my mother loaned me the money to publish it and now I get to keep everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, so oh, there. Oh, yeah, so there. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, poetry is kind of haunted by uh, it, the very word rejection. You send out a poem, it gets rejected. Why do we use the word reject right. They They weren't able to use it. You know, right. they were full. They had a similar poem. They're looking for shorter poems. You know, there are a yeah. lot of reasons they send it back. 
But writers think that the assessment of their work is an assessment of themselves. Right. That's a mistake. Sure. Uh, so the remedy is write many things, send them many places, yeah. let them find a home. I, I took a course one day, a class, uh, and uh, I wish I could remember the fellow's name. He was, this sounds counterintuitive, he was a famous, okay. uh, and I can't yeah. remember his name, but yeah. uh, science fiction writer. And it was an hour long class. Yeah. He stood up in front and he said, I'm going to tell you how to get published. Right. Write, send it out, and do it again. Yeah. Are there any questions? Yeah. And so the, the res, yeah. you know, uh, 59 and a half minutes were, yeah. <laughs> were questions because yeah. that's what it was. You got to write. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was talking to my dad one time and I said, uh, you know, you and I just have dumb persistence yeah. for getting published because you, you just keep sending. And one thing is you, pu you send it out to get it off your desk so you can do right. a new thing. Right. You know, so, so you're publishing, you're not seeking fame, you're not seeking success, you're trying to keep your desk clear. Yeah. Okay, give it a chance, let your, let your poem go to college, you know, leave yeah. home. Yeah, Because you got another little one here to nurture. Great. Yeah. Kim, we are getting down on time, yeah. and I want to, so two things. One is, uh, I would like to hear about growing up in your family, yeah. that must have been something. Uh, and is there something that you'd like to talk about or tell us or yeah well in my family you know both my parents were teachers yes so there were a lot of books around and a lot of curiosity okay a lot of uh, talk at the dinner table you know we would linger and there'd be stories and there'd be questions and my father periodically would say rubbing his hands let's talk recklessly right and that meant let's just gossip about everything let's talk about people books ideas and so that uh, appetite for, uh, for stories, for questions, for mysteries. Uh, and then my mom, as a teacher, uh, you know, she had a way of, she only had the use of her left hand. Oh, I didn't know that. So, you know, it was all about beckoning. She couldn't reach out and grab you. It was all about inviting. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, I watched her teach, and she just, she was at the edge of the, action just inviting people to do this and that well, so it's a place it, of great welcome uh, uh, what makes me what i think of when i think of that yeah. is to get somebody's attention whisper yeah you know yeah, to be quiet right. rather than loud yeah 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 and i guess if there's something i want to say um i want to invite uh, all people to be part of the conversation of our time great not to let other people explain things to them and then take it lying down. But to stand up and say, this is how it is for me. Mm -hmm. This is what I want to contribute. Uh, this is an idea I had. And it's like there's an economy of money and there's an economy of stories, of ideas, of mm. visions. And I think we each have an opportunity, and I want to say an obligation, to put the best we have into words and send them forth in a way that we can all be uplifted by our communal interactive uh, language. Well, I love that. One last thing, you talked about uh, reckless talking. Yes. You also talk about eloquent listening. Yes. Yeah. Just well, eloquent listening is uh, leaning forward, mm -hmm. you know, saying instead of, that reminds me of, tell me more about that. Right. I, I need to understand that. How is that? And I really got this from my grandmother. Okay. Because I would come home from the woods and I'd be all, you know, filthy with mud, and <laughs> cockle burrs and my socks and everything. And she would just uh, essentially interview me, what you're doing with me. She'd say, well, so Kimmy, what did you find? Let me see that. What was that like? Where was it? You know, just drawing the question, you out. drawing yeah. me out, which I was very shy as a kid. I never talked in class and so on. And she gave me the idea that there was something in there that she wanted to hear about, and maybe the world did too. Uh-huh. Yeah. Man. So that's eloquent listening. Kim Stafford, thank you so thank much. Thank you. What, what, a, what a pleasure. What a pleasure. What, a, what an honor to have you here. Thank you. Wow, folks. That, is this the coolest thing ever to, to get to do this? <laughs> uh, thank you so much for watching. I'm Stephen W. Long. Visit me at stephenwlong.com. Uh, come back and see The Writing Life again. And one more time, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All right. Take care.
What do you think? We done? I don't know. You guys want to do one yeah, just with yourself? As long as they think the we're done, if no, they got no, enough, no. they got enough. They got enough? Probably. Right. Okay. Sounds good. Let's go have. Let's go to lunch. I'm, oh. I'm hungry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can just bite too.